Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder, and today, rule of law is a matter of public policy. On Sunday, May 10th, 2020, which is Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day, mothers, by the way, and, uh, you know, why would you want to talk about something like this on Mother's Day, but it's on behalf of all the mothers that we talk about things like this, to make changes in public policy which will affect the rule of law. And uh, former President Obama said something here just a couple days ago that, you know, fits right in with this. That there's a lot of hay being made about it right now on the Internet. But uh, what did he say exactly? So here were some of the quotes that he had said that uh, this was a telephone conversation that had somehow been released to the news media, whether he did it or it was done by NSA or God knows who. You know, this is what the conversation said. The news over the last 24 hours, I think, has been somewhat downplayed about the Justice Department dropping charges against Michael Flynn. And the fact that there is no precedent that anybody can find for someone who has been charged with perjury to uh, just getting off scot-free. That's the kind of stuff where you begin to get worried about the basic not just institutional norms, but our basic understanding of the rule of law is at risk. And when you start moving in those directions, it can accelerate pretty quickly, as we have seen in other places. And um, so as we'll see, this, you know, this idea of what is exactly the rule of law, but the first thing to notice is that Obama said that uh, Flynn was being charged with perjury. Which, you know, when you look at what they said he was in this court case, it says it was uh, a false statement, uh, 18 United States Code 1001, 1001, has to do with a false statement. And there are sections of Title 18, United States Code, that have to do with perjury, but those weren't the ones that were on his uh, complaint that had been filed, at least in the case they're showing. And I have shown this before that um, uh, in his case, right, so this is Michael T. Flynn. He's the defendant in two cases. They both have the same court case numbers, uh, 1 colon 17 CR 00232 EGS, and then one has a dash 1 behind it, right? So the, the one without the dash 1 is the USA versus Flynn. And that's the one you can see documents of online or if you want the PACER and so forth. But you can't find a case that's just Michael T. Flynn with the same court case number with a dash one. It's like, well, is this the perjury case that Obama's talking about that we don't see? Now, understand that what's happening to uh, General Flynn being charged for you know false accusation is just standard operating business in every court in the United States. All courts that you go to are courts of the false accuser. Because nobody swears to anything. Right? They may try to get you to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And then they have you because you don't have any idea what the truth is either, so you really can't swear to it. You know, but you just did, so well, then you're a blasphemer, and the spiritual court that these courts actually are, black robe priest, right? It's a spiritual court under Talmudic law. Something similar to that. Uh, you know, I've shown a previous videos where the Congress and the President of the United States at the time, uh, George Bush Sr., said that, uh, you know, the, our nation is governed by the Noahide laws. So enough on that. I just wanted to point out the fact that there are two court cases against General Flynn that have basically the same number, filed the same date, but one has a dash one and the other one doesn't. And the one without the dash one is the USA versus Flynn, while the other one is Michael T. Flynn. Without anybody against, right? There's only one party. Uh, so I say it's two different courts in two different jurisdictions. But what do I know? So uh, hang on, so i got to get back to where it was. Just a second here. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, in the same article I was reading then, because this had happened with uh, what Obama had said, uh, they were talking to the Attorney General, and however, the Attorney General perhaps spoke for the president earlier when he was asked how he thought history would view his decision to drop the Flynn case. 
He said, well, history is written by the winner, he told CBS News, so it largely depends on who is writing the history. And uh, so I think what is happening, or what could happen, what is being set up to happen, is that we could change the basic understanding of what the rule of law is, which right now the rule is that you can uh, falsely accuse people and you don't have to have an oath of office to have any authority. Again, I've shown in many videos, and I'll be showing again in this video, that these people don't have the oath that satisfies the sixth article of the Constitution. And so whatever they're doing from the president on down, they're not doing under the Constitution. They've either taken an oath that says, so help me God, or they've uh, not taken the oath to support the Constitution. And all this was ratified, or after the Constitution was ratified, in the very first law, the very first Congress, they passed a law that says this is the oath you need to take to satisfy the sixth article of the Constitution. I state your name, you solemnly swear to support the Constitution of the United States. That's the whole oath. And now that's been codified into the United States Code under four, Title IV, right, the number four, USC for United States Code 101, which says this is the oath you need to take if you're a member of the legislature or an officer of the state, you know, to satisfy the federal government before you can exercise any authority of your office. And so that would mean that, you know, this is what the governor needs to take, and the attorney general, and the secretary of state, and the treasurer, and um, every judge, every member of the Senate or of the House, all representatives, all commissions, on and on and on. Because, you know, at, after you get to the state, there is a local level, but it's just a political subdivision of the state. It's still part of the state government. And so all these people, I say, have to take this oath. Well, they haven't done it, you know, and again, I've shown that in other videos, but just setting the stage for what's going on now, right? So we, what we need to do is get that changed by affecting the public policy to uh, have an influence on the rule of law. So I guess we should do things in order. Uh, if you wanted to email me, uh, Rob Ryder, my email address is courtofrecord at AOL.com. C-O-U-R-T-O-F-R-E-C-O-R-D at A-O-L dot com. Phone number 616-712-6179. I am Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Rutluski, U.S. Army veteran, DOD ID 12-112-80006. And at this current point in time, I'm being held as a prisoner of war by uh, somebody impersonating the governor of the state of Michigan, lowercase state of Michigan, um, who's a member of the terrorist organization, State of Michigan. More on that in a minute. But the term rule of law, now this comes right out of Wikipedia, so the term rule of law is closely related to constitutionalism as well as Reichstadt and refers to a political situation, not to any specific legal rule. Oh, it has nothing to do with going and finding the law that says this is the rule of law. No, it has to do with the political situation. Who's in charge? Who's ever in charge determines what the rule of law is. Yeah, that's a wonderful system. So what we need to do is replace the devil with Jesus, right? Going to have the, if we usher in the thousand-year reign of Christ, we won't have to deal with this false accuser system anymore. And this pandemic crisis is the thing that's making this available to us, and we should not ever um, uh, waste a crisis. So public policy, then, is the process by which governments translate their political vision into programs and actions to deliver outcomes, desired changes in the real world. In uh, private international law, the public policy doctrine, or order public, concerns the body of principles that underpin the operation of legal systems in each state. Right? It's all about public policy. This addresses the social, moral, and economic values that tie a society together. Values that vary in different cultures and change over time. Right? You can change the public policy, which will affect 
what the definition of the rule of law is for that particular society at that time. So what we need to do is uh, change public policy. And so that's what this video is about. Well, how could you do that? Well, let's, we're going to look at some things that uh, I'm trying to do with it, and maybe you'll want to do the same or something different. But, you know, let's uh, use all the tools that we have available to us. And that's the plan. So hang on a second. Yeah, I want to throw this in here because I had found it, and I was like, oh, I need to talk about this. Ah, political climate. Right? We all hear about climate change. Well, guess what? There's a thing called political climate. The political climate is the aggregate mood and opinions of political society at any particular time. It is generally used to describe when the state of mood and opinion is changing or unstable rather than in a state of equilibrium. The phrase has origins from both ancient Greece and medieval France. All right, so political climate is, uh, that's common law, man. It goes all the way back to ancient Greece. And so when we talk climate change, this is what we're, Speaking of, all right, climate change has nothing to do with the temperature of the earth. It has to do with, uh, uh, actually, if you look in the dictionary under uh, in uh, Webster's 1828, you know, it talks about basically you have these different climates that circumnavigate or circum circle the earth, temperate climate, rainforest climate, and so forth, and it's, you know, that kind of climate change. People from one climate go into another place. But there's also this thing called political climate. And uh, there it is, right? I didn't know that such a thing existed until today, but sure enough. So that's what we're going through is a political climate change at this particular time. It's a wonderful time to be alive. All right, hang on a second. Okay, so as illustration, because this is the sections I was using for the things that I've done here in the last week that I'll be talking about. Uh, we'll be looking at the Michigan Catholic Conference and uh, the way that the Catholic Church handled its business under the pledge it signed with the United States. But it's no different than what the Protestant churches did back in 1917 or the Jewish League did or whatever the proper name is. I'll have to go find it here in a second. But um, this Michigan Catholic Conference is... Uh, a remnant of uh, this institution that it was a civil institution created by the Catholic Church called the uh, National Catholic War Council, right? And it was, uh, you know, uh, incorporated civilly. But then the uh, Department of War gave it a commission, right? So it's, you know, commissioned by the freaking Department of War. So it's part of the government. Well, they did the same thing with the... Um, with the Protestant churches and uh, with the Jewish people, because they don't say synagogue necessarily. So again, I have to look and see exactly what it is. But you know, so um, the Michigan Catholic Conference. Then, what about it? Well, it says founded in 1963, right? Because this is, uh, you know, they keep shifting things around. But it started from this thing called the National Catholic War Council in 1917. But this was founded in 1963. The Michigan Catholic Conference serves as the official voice of the Catholic Church in Michigan on matters of public policy. Well, that's, you know, that should be its own sentence all by itself without anything else around it. That's pretty powerful stuff to say that this entity here, right, uh, Michigan Catholic Conference, is the official voice of the Catholic Church. It's not the bishop. It's not a priest, you know, it's not a parish. No, it's this thing right here, this entity, the Michigan Catholic Conference. And, uh, you know, so they go to the state house and they sit across the table from people in the, the government and, you know, they advocate for whatever uh, the church wants to advocate for. Well, we just need to give them different things to advocate for, such as, hey, the governor doesn't have an oath to office. How about talking to them about that, Catholic Conference? Right? You need to say that's bad faith, because only the church can call out matters of bad faith. <laughs> that's what the Supreme Court said, that the courts don't have any jurisdiction in matters of faith. And so if you went back and looked, well, how did they do it in England back in the day, way back in time, way back in the common law, uh, I'd say before 1066, because I think that's when they changed it, 
uh, that the earl and the bishop used to sit together and hear all matters, you know, before the court. And that, the, you know, the bishop would be making determinations on matters of faith, and then based on whatever their determination was, if there was any penalty associated with that, like perjury, well, then the state would execute the penalty. But the penalty was determined by the state. All that was happening is the church was determining if that's what happened. Was it perjury or not? Right? Was it a bad act of bad faith? done and uh, consciously done, or was it just a mistake? Well, that's what the church needs to do now. They need to say, hey, this oath of office is bad faith. You either need to fix it or suffer the penalty. So, um, you know, that's the idea is, hey, public policy can go because this Michigan Catholic Conference then, or any similar thing, as we'll see, the Protestant churches have all sorts of them too, well, they, you know, they're basically your representative to the government. So if you go yourself, let's say I wanted to get the oath of office of the governor, right? I can do a Freedom of Information Act as the public, right? This thing, the public. But they could go there, the Michigan Catholic Conference, in person to the Secretary of State's office and say, show us the oath of office. And if they're not done right, start to complain. From a different you know, jurisdictional standpoint that we can as the public because we've been kind of shuffled off to the side like we don't exist, right? So um, so that's what they said. Now, if you just go and Google church public policy, you'll see that uh, the Church of uh, God in Christ Office of Public Policy is a public policy information advocacy office for the church. Its task is to advocate and to help, blah, 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 right? So the Church of God in Christ has got a public uh, policy office. The Episcopal Public Policy Network of the Episcopal Church, right? They got a whole network of public policy offices. Uh, So does the Church of uh, Jesus and Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. They have an office on public policy. It goes on and on and on, right? There's there's plenty of uh, evidence that these things exist. Here's the Lutheran Church. State public policy offices are Lutheran advocacy presence at state government level. Well, would you please go ask the governor why I should have an oath, an oath of office? That satisfies the sixth article of the Constitution. And ask the Secretary of State why she doesn't. And ask the Treasurer why she doesn't. And ask the uh, Attorney General, why she doesn't? I think in you know, I think in Michigan, I, I don't know about the treasurer, but the Secretary of State, the treasurer, or the Secretary of State, the governor, and the uh, Attorney General, they're all women, right? So why don't they have a proper oath of office? I don't really care that they are. I mean, but you know, <laughs> I'm a veteran. I took a proper oath of office. I'm not taking no shit from somebody who didn't take a proper oath of office. And so I don't care if it's Mother's Day, Mother. Right? Because I'm sure all these women are mothers. You know, it just isn't right. Don't teach your children to, to treat people that way. So there's plenty of, you know, opportunities to find an office that has something to do with uh, public policy and, you know, go complain to them. That's what I'm going to do. And then just here recently... Um, the Catholic Church, a, a bunch of cardinals just put this out here in the last few days. Right? That they're saying, uh, in this time of great crisis, we pastors of the Catholic Church, by virtue of our mandate, consider it our sacred duty to take an appeal to our brothers in the episcopate, to the clergy, to the religious, to the holy people of God, and to all men and women of goodwill. This appeal has also been undersigned by intellectuals, doctors, lawyers, journalists, professors, professionals, who agree with this content and may be undersigned by those who wish to make it their own, period. All right, so, I mean, the Catholic Church is stepping up. They're complaining. So let's, you know, give them the right thing to complain about. Don't just make noise. You know, pick an issue and get an answer to it. So that's the plan. So hang on a second here. Okay, so um, for those that are interested in this kind of stuff, if you went to... uh, 
the National, what is this, the Catholic Universities of America, University Libraries, National Catholic War Council, right? They have all their records in here, whatever was agreed. So in here you'll find that the, this council was given um, authority of some kind under the, the War Council or the Department of War. Right now, you're going to have to find where it's ever been rescinded because it's like taking an oath of office. Once you take it, you know you're bound by that oath until uh, further notice. Actually, mine isn't an oath of office; it's an oath of enlistment. And once enlisted, you're always enlisted. Nobody who's ever been enlisted has been released from the military. Right? They don't issue you a order that says you've been administratively separated from the military. Then you're still in. Okay, and uh, so then the Federal Council of Churches of Christ in America records, right? This is the entity that was in creation in the time of the war. Um, of World War One, right? That cut its own deal with uh, <clears throat> the War Department. And that now is called the National Council of Churches of Christ in the USA. Right? So none of these things have gone away. They just change their name and kind of roll along and change who's going to do what and so forth. But they don't ever end anything that they've started. They only continue to add. So at the root is this idea that in 1917, all of these entities got some authority um, from the United States government. And... Uh, well, let's look at that, because I think it's kind of interesting how they did that. So, there's a book that's called The American Catholics in the War. It says do with World War I. Uh, in which it says, you know, on April 6, 1917, President Wilson issued his proclamation declaring a state of war exists between the United States and the German imperial government. Right, so who was the war between? The United States and the German imperial government. So for this war to end, you're going to have to find um, a peace treaty that has the general, uh, the German imperial government, uh, you know, stopping the war. And there isn't one. So then on April 4th, you know, a couple days later, we got a declaration of war. Say, hey, we're at war now. So 12 days after the declaration of war, on April 18th, the archbishops of the Catholic Church in the United States, right, Catholic Church in the United States, assembled for their annual meeting at the Catholic University in Washington, expressed the loyalty of their clergy and faithful laity, and pro proffered their services, right, proffered their services to the government in a message which repeated the pledge given at Baltimore 33 years before. The pledge of the Catholic Church. Well, you know, we have to stop and think about this for a minute. You know, that's like taking an oath. Right? They pledged the Catholic Church, and so this Michigan Catholic Conference really doesn't have a... It doesn't have a choice, whether it knows it or not, right? Because of what happened in 1917, it has a duty. Let's read about it. So the Pledge of the Catholic Church. This letter ran as follows. Standing firmly upon our solid Catholic tradition and history, from the very foundation of this nation, we affirm in this hour of stress and trial our most sacred and sincere loyalty and patriotism toward our country, our government, and our flag. Moved to the very depths of our hearts by the stirring appeal of the President of the United States, and by the action of our national Cong uh, of our national Congress, we accept wholeheartedly and unreservably the decree of that legislative authority, authority proclaiming this country to be in a state of war. We had prayed that we might be spared the dire necessity of entering the conflict, but now that war has been declared, we bow in obedience to the summons to bear our part in it with fidelity, with courage, and with spirit of sacrifice, which, as loyal citizens, we are bound to manifest for the defense of the most sacred rights and welfare of the whole nation. 
acknowledging gladly the gratitude that we have always felt for the protection of our spiritual liberty and the freedom of our Catholic institutions under the flag, we pledge our devotion and our strength in the maintenance of our country's glorious leadership and those possessions and principles that have been America's proudest boast. Inspired neither by hate or fear, but by the whole sent, holy sentiments of truest patriotic fever, fervor, and zeal, we stand ready, we and all the flock committed to our keeping, to cooperate in every way possible with our president and our national government to end that great and holy cause uh, to the end that the great and holy cause of liberty may triumph and that our beloved country may emerge from this hour of test stronger and nobler than ever. Our people, as ever, will rise as one man to serve the nation. Our priests and consecrated women will once again, as in every former trial of our country, win by their bravery, their heroism, and their service, new admiration and approval. We are all true Americans, ready as our age, our ability, and our condition permit to do whatever is in us to do for the preservation, the progress, and the triumph of our beloved country. May God direct and guide our president and our government that out of this trying crisis, our national life may at length come to closer union among all citizens of America and that an enduring and blessed peace may crown the sacrifices which war inevitably entails. So the president to whom this message was sent by Cardinal Gibbons, so this message, this pledge was written and sent to the president and his sense of importance of the Catholic Pledge may be seen in his reply to Cardinal Gibbons. And the president replied, right? So it's offer and acceptance. That's just, you know, you can't get any more commerce than that. <clears throat> so uh, the very remarkable resolution unanimously adopted by the Archbishop of the United States at their annual meeting in the Catholic University on April 18th last, a copy of which you were kind enough to send to me, warms my heart and makes me very proud indeed that men of such large influence should act in so large a sense of patriotism and so admirable a spirit of devotion to our common country. So, you know, that's what the Catholic Church did. I'm sure the Protestant churches did the same thing. You know, if I just, I didn't find their book. I found the Catholic book. So there you are. So let it be written, so let it be done. So this Catholic conference then, they had, uh, they put out this handbook, and in there it said, if you wanted to find, if you were a Protestant, and you wanted to find, well, what did we do? Right, it's right here. The General Wartime Commission on the Federal Churches of Christ in America. What did the Jews do? Well, they had the Jewish Welfare, Welfare Board of the United States Army and Navy. And the National Organization the War Work Catholic Church is a National Catholic War Council. Well, that war has never ended. World War I never ended. There is no peace treaty. So all of these people, all these persons created, right? These were all civil persons created by their church, churches, right? That were given a commission by the military. Well, that commission is still good. And we're not under a constitutional government, so I guess this is the other thing. I'll add that to this. We're really not under the Constitution right now. We're under martial law. We have been since 1861 when President Lincoln declared martial law in the District of Columbia. It's never been rescinded. Right? And it's in the Lieber Code. Second article of the Lieber Code says that once martial law has been declared, it doesn't stop until there's either a special proclamation or a treaty of peace. Well, that didn't happen after the Civil War, and it didn't happen after World War I. So enemies, foreign and domestic, are still a thing of today because uh, those two wars are still ongoing. 
An armistice is only a ceasefire during a time of hostilities, but it doesn't end the hostilities. Excuse me. Okay, hang on a second. Okay, well then, knowing all those things, as I did during this week, it's like, well, what can I do with what I have, you know, stumbled across or led by uh, the Holy Spirit or however you want to come, describe it. To me, it's all led by the Holy Spirit. Some people say it's coincidences, but there really aren't any such thing, right? The Holy Spirit lines all these things up and like Jesus says, the Holy Spirit acts like smoke, right? It's all over the place. You know, he, he just, the Holy Spirit does as the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit said uh, to me, well, since the Michigan Catholic Conference serves as the official voice of the Catholic Church in Michigan on matters of public policy, that I should write to them maybe and say, hey, that the governor doesn't have an oath of office. And as it turns out, when you, yeah, I don't think that was the right one. Nope. So I was looking through the contact list and well, look at that public policy. They got people working there for that reason, right? Four people work at the Michigan Catholic conference under the heading of public policy. Now, because this thing has a board of directors, which includes the Archbishop of Detroit and the Bishop of Kalamazoo, and it has to have at least five laypersons on it, right? Plus five laypersons. So these are the people that make up the board of directors. And so maybe it's the board of directors that needs to tell the uh, lobbyist to go lobby. So, you know, I'll grab a bunch of their email addresses and send them all one email. So that's what I did. Then I noticed, look, they also have risk management and claims. And uh, so my last video, I was showing that in any uh, casualty type of insurance, um, such as general liability insurance, you have to watch the video to see exactly what they all were. They all have this... Uh, section added in that's under the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act of 2002 that, you know, basically for no charge, you're offered coverage from uh, acts of terrorism. So if that's what we could say the governor's doing, and so the only thing it takes for it to be an act of terrorism is for the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States to say it's an act of terrorism, and then it is. So I'm thinking, well, these guys, you know, they should just go ahead and file their own, because they're probably self-insured, file a claim, their own claim, and then turn it into the Department of uh, Treasury for the treasurer to make a decision. Now, I'm trying to do the same thing on mine, but I have to send it to, uh, you know, an outside source of insurance that doesn't really want to play the game right now. I, they can see what I'm trying to do, and I can already tell that they don't want to you know, they're hoping I don't figure out what to do about it, right? But it's almost like an adversarial situation. But if you were your own insurer, it's not adversarial. Go file a claim against yourself because you're going to be paying yourself anyways. Make it for more than $5 million and turn it into the Department of Treasury so that the treasurer can make a decision and certify if what's happening is a act of terrorism. And we'll look at that exactly more in a second, but you know, that's what we're doing. We're trying to use what's already ma been made available to our benefit instead of, you know, just letting it sit there and not being used. So what did I do? You know, this is... So this is what I did. Is I decided... What is this? Today's the 10th. So on the 8th, two days ago, to the Michigan Catholic Conference Board of Directors Public Policy Division. R.E. Gretchen Esther Whitmer is a terrorist impersonating as the governor of Michigan and the Michigan Catholic Conference owes a duty to the United States to inform the military. Now, how come I know that? Well, because of the things I just read, right? I mean, it's, it's right there. It's kind of hard to say that shit isn't what I've said it is. And when we look at the oath to say that 
Gretchen didn't take the proper oath is, well, nobody has, right? Unless they can show it, they haven't taken it. So uh, Gretchen Esther Whitmer and anybody else claiming an office under the United States, just make it clear, I'm not just picking on her, but, you know, she's the one that issued the orders. So failed to file the oath of office that satisfies the sixth article of the Constitution of the United States, which would be, I, Gretchen Esther Whitmer, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. It's really that simple. Right, this oath is found in the first law passed by the first Congress after ratification of the Constitution of the United States, which is, you know, the law is called an act to regulate the time and manner of administering certain oaths. It's in 1 Stat 23. Uh, Statutes at Large, you know, Volume 1, page 23. It's the very first law passed by the very first Congress after the ratification of the Constitution. Page 1. Now codified as for United States Code USC 101, which is oath by members of legislature and officers. Nor did Gretchen Esther Whitmer take and subscribe the oath as provided in Section 1 of Article 11 of the State Constitution in accordance with the Michigan Election Law Act 116 of 1954. So not only does she need to take the one that satisfies the federal government, she needs to take another oath that satisfies the Michigan Election Law. Yes, she needs to take two oaths of office. Go figure. So does the president. Right? That's what has to happen, and these things aren't happening. So in bad faith, Gretchen Esther Whitmer, Gretchen Esther Whitmer filed a counterfeit oath using the alias Gretchen Whitmer. This oath incorporates an improper style of grammar, was subscribed using a fictitious identity, and witnessed by an unqualified office. It was done by a notary, not by like the Secretary of State or something like that. Gretchen Esther Whitmer is not Governor of Michigan. She is a terrorist. Right? Gretchen Esther Whitmer is a conspirator in a scheme by the terrorist organization State of Michigan to usurp the power and authority of the state. Right? Michigan is the state. Its name isn't State of Michigan, it's just Michigan. But there's this thing called the state of Michigan running around that's causing all this problem. Well, it's a terrorist organization. Uh, up until recently, you could find it listed in Dun & Bradstreet. Right? So it's a business. It's not the government. It's just a fucking organization. And it's a terrorist organization. By many acts of terrorism, which would be simulating emergency orders, Gretchen Esther Whitmer has coerced the citizens of the United States in Michigan to comply to unconstitutional confinement orders and to coerce the United States government to comply with the desires of terrorist organizations she represents. And all that comes right out of the act of, uh, you know, just go look up uh, terrorist, Terrorism Risk Insurance Act of 2002. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Now, they've changed it, they've changed the definition, and I'll show you what it is today, but that's where it started, right? And, all, and it's been incorporated into all policies of insurance. And in a uh, casualty insurance like that, you're the insured. And this is the thing that the insurance company doesn't want to admit for me. It says, no, that's to insure the state from you. No, my insurance is to protect me from whatever. It's no-fault insurance. I would file it with my insurance company, and then they would battle it out with somebody else. And I showed all that in my last video. So, back to the narrative here. All government offices of the state of Michigan, or case S, state of Michigan, or it could just be real case S, state of Michigan, but I don't want to confuse it. It's not this entity called state of Michigan. The government is just Michigan. Look at a map. It says Michigan. Right, it doesn't say state of Michigan. All government offices of Michigan are vacant or qualified incumbent because the alleged incumbent has not filed the oath mandated by the United States government in 4 U.S.C. 101. The offices of senators, representative, judge, justice, secretary of state, attorney general, DNR, state treasurer, sheriff, local legislator, Commissioners, supervisors, state police, school boards, etc. are vacant, qualified incumbents simply for not executing a constitutionally required oath. 
It doesn't take any more for you not to have any authority. You didn't take the oath, you don't have any authority. That's how she works. Right? But the rule of law now is, well, you don't have to have an oath to have authority. So all you need to do is change what that means and say, well, no, now what it means is to have authority, you have to have an oath. And watch how the world changes. An oath, vow, or promise is an act of faith, and to simulate counterfeit one is bad faith. It appears that the only person to have sworn and subscribed a valid oath are members of the armed forces of the United States, of which I am one. I have never been administratively separated from the military, and I invoke my privileges as a member in good standing and order the Michigan Catholic Conference to defend the Constitution of the United States as the Catholic Church in the United States promised. In 1917, the Catholic Church in the United States pledged its allegiance to the United States. This promise was accepted by the President of the United States, thereby obligating the Michigan Catholic Conference to inform the United States military government of an ongoing insurrection and rebellion by Gretchen Esther Whitmer and her minions terrorist organization within Michigan, United States. The Supreme Court of the United States is on record ruling that the church, not the court, has jurisdictions in matters of faith. In old England, once the church passed judgment, the court could pronounce the penalty. It is no different here today in the United States. The state of Michigan is an association of terrorists. It is not the government of Michigan. It is a terrorist organization and its officers are enemies of the United States. In the name of Jesus, the Lord, I order Catholic Church official voice of public policy call out the bad faith acts of torts, as torts and inform the Commander-in-Chief of the United States without delay. The Catholic Church in the United States has a duty to God and country no different than any other service member. And I am an expectation of the Michigan Catholic Conference, making God, both God and country proud of the Catholic Church in the United States. So help you God. Amen. Oh, and P.S., uh, the Michigan Catholic Conference should file a terrorism risk insurance claim and submit to the Secretary of Treasury for his certification of the act of terrorism. I have attempted to do this already and have attached my incident report and certificate of insurance for your review and ask for any guidance that might be provided to get the insurer to settle my claim as the producer insurer and insurer on the certificate of insurance seem unwilling to process my claim in good faith. They really don't want to do that. Okay, right, that's what I wrote to the, you know, Michigan Catholic Conference. Now, if you can think of something else and you want to write somebody, go ahead. But you know, I'm just telling you, make it about this. Make it about the fact that nobody is... Satisfy the sixth article of the Constitution. This is the only oath that'll do it. It had to be just like this. I state your name, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And we'll show you where that came from. Let's go ahead and look. All right, so here's uh, Acts of the First Congress of the United States. Where this is uh, June 1st, 1789, an act to regulate the time and manner of administering certain oaths, in which it says the oath affirmation required by the sixth article of the Constitution of the United States shall, 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 shall be administered in the following form. To wit, I state your name. You solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Now, I've had people in the past, and here again just recently, they, you know, make a big deal about the word shall from a lawyer's point of view to me. And to me, that doesn't mean anything because I'm looking at it from a military point of view. And in the military, shall does mean shall. There is no excuse. If you shall do something and don't do it, well, then you violated a freaking regulation. And a regulation is a written order. So now you violate a written order. Well, you got all sorts of problems in. Right? This isn't attorney word shall. This is military word shall. Because we're under martial law. We're not under the Constitution. So that's where it said it there. And then in Title IV, right, this, so this is today, right, here in Section 101, the oath by members of legislature and officers, every member of state legislature and every executive and judicial officer of the state shall, 
before he proceeds to execute the duties of his office, take the oath in the following form. To wit, I, Gretchen Esther Whitmer, do silence swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Now, the oath of the president in Article 2 doesn't say the word support. So, if we went back to this act, because this covers everybody, this covers the Senate, the House of Representatives, all uh, executive judicial officers, both of the several states and the United States, you know, and, and it covers everybody. Right? Everybody has to take this oath, according to this act. From 1789, the first law passed after the ratification of the Constitution. <clears throat> it's just easier to, you know, carry this around. So, you know, so now, if you have a court case going, or you have any kind of issue of any kind with any government entity, you should give them a copy of this and say, look, if you don't have this oath of office, you don't have any authority. You're going to have to stop. We need to, you know, make it a matter of public policy that you have to have this oath of office, or we don't have to listen to you. Right now, the rule of law is bent the other way, saying, well, if we say so, you got to do it. But that can change, right? That's just the way it's looked at today, because it's really not a law. It's just a it's a perception. Ah, my certificate of insurance. Hey, there it is, right? I'm the insured. So I showed all this in my last video. Um, just go to Rob Ryder, R-O-B-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R on YouTube and search by upload date. And uh, I don't want to put it again in this video because it takes take too much time, but... You know, I filed this certificate with this incident report to my insurance company. Because uh, there's the insured. That was me, Robert Allen Bretluski. And I did it in my name. Again, I have an EIN in my name. Right? EIN 82-365-4127. As a sole proprietor. And, uh, you know, this is simple enough to do. Just, what's the occurrence? of loss due to certified act of terrorism by state of Michigan. What activity was going on? The Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, certified act of terrorism. Because in the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, as it's written today, they give the definition of what a certified act of terrorism is. And all it is is to try to coerce the, civ uh, the civilian population of the United States or to coerce the actions of the United States government. Right? If you're trying to coerce them to do something, in either case, it's an act of terrorism. Officers, agents, and employees of the state of Michigan conspire to usurp the authority of the government of the state of Michigan, or case that state of Michigan, to coerce civilian population of the United States and Michigan and to affect the conduct of the U.S. government, uh, producing losses in excess of $5 million. These persons have not filed and recorded the oath of office required by federal law for USC 101, oath by members of the legislature and officers, and they have no authority, period. Well, who's my witnesses? Well, the woman that did it, Gretchen Esther Whitmer, and the one that's supposed to make sure she does it right, which is the Secretary of State, Jocelyn Michelle Benson. Additional information, uh, in an act of bad faith, Gretchen Esther Whitmer filed a counterfeit oath of office under an assumed name in the Michigan Department of State as part of a scheme to usurp the constitutional office of governor of Michigan by a simulated legal process. Her deed is an act of war against the people of the United States and Michigan. I have attached her false oath and 4 USC 101 to this report. And we've seen before USC 101, but here's her oath of office. Right? It doesn't say I state your name. There's no Gretchen Esther Whitmer in there. So while this could be an oath of office she needs to take, it's not the one I'm looking for. If the state says you need to take this oath of office, Governor, that's fine. But where's the one the federal government said to take? You didn't comply with federal law. So federal trumps states. Just the way she works in a republic. Uh, okay, so the office of governor, and she signed it as Gretchen Whitmer, which isn't her name. It's Gretchen Esther Whitmer. That's her full legal name. Needs to be used in all legal matters. 
which an oath of office is definitely a legal matter. It's also a matter of faith. And it was done wrong. And uh, this was sworn before a notary. And if you were to search Michigan law, you would find out, well, a notary can't uh, officiate the governor taking an oath of office. They needs to be the secretary of state or, you know, a state officer. So it's just wrong. Well, so I had done all this, and just one more thing to read, because I had done it also, and I said, well, you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to send this to the Pope to tell him that I've told the Michigan Catholic Conference. But I need to pull something up real quick. Hang on a second. So on uh, March 25th, uh, 2020, Pope Francis dropped all of his titles from this thing called the Pontifical Yearbook, right? And uh, this cardinal, uh, Vigano, is the same guy who wrote this appeal here, or has something to do with this appeal written on May 7, 2020. So what he has pointed out, and it's been pointed out by in a, a number of different places, but it says on March 25th, the Political Yearbook was published with a real novelty. It may seem like a typographical trifle, but the part uh, dedicated to reigning pontiff, but this is not the case. Until last year, in fact, Francis's titles were listed at the top of the page, beginning with Vicar of Christ, successor of Prince of the Apostles, etc., and then he with his birth name and a uh, very brief biography. The new edition, on the other hand, the secular name, or, or gay Mario Bergoglio stands out in large letters followed by the biography. The change in layout, um, uh, separately separated by a dash, and the words historical titles, and all titles of the Roman pontiff are then listed as if they were no longer an integral part of the Manus Pertinium that legitimizes the authority of which the church recognizes in the Pope. So what are we talking about? Well, it used to have all of his titles in his name, and now it has his name and then his titles. But his titles are down here under a separate line that says these are just historical titles. So he's basically given up all of his titles. Well, what could that mean? Uh, an almost uh, defiant gesture, one might say, in which Francis transcends, transcends every title. Or worse, an act to officially alter the papacy by which he no longer recognizes himself as guardian, but becomes master of the church and free to demolish it from within without having to answer anyone or, in short, a tyrant. Well, excellent. I'm going to go to him now and talk to him in his new role as tyrant and tell him, hey, the church made this you know, pledge. Can you please make him follow it? So, Orge Mario Bergoglio, Bishop of Rome, a.k.a. Pope Francis, care of the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Penitentiary. So, Bishop Bergoglio, in 1917, the Roman Catholic Church in the United States formally pledged the Church to the wartime service of the United States. This pledge was accepted by the President of the United States, and the Catholic Church in the United States Civil Corporation was given a military commission. Neither the Pledge or Wartime Commission has been rescinded. The Michigan Catholic Conference claims to serve as the official voice of the Catholic Church in Michigan on matters of public policy and has a duty to use this voice for the common defense of the United States from enemies foreign and domestic. Gretchen Esther Whitmer did not qualify for the office of Governor of Michigan because she did not execute the oath of office that satisfies the sixth article of the Constitution of the United States. She has no authority in the United States, and her ever simulated emergency is an act of terrorism intended to coerce the citizens of the United States and Michigan to comply with her unlawful order. She is not alone in usurping the office of the government in Michigan, and I have infer informed the Michigan Catholic Conference, of its need to condemn as bad faith all counterfeit oaths of office. 
Michigan Catholic Conference is a canonically recognized entity answerable to God, the Holy See, and the Bishop of Rome. In the name of Jesus the Lord, I ask you ensure the Michigan Catholic Conference upholds the pledge made by the Catholic Church in the United States and warns the Commander-in-Chief of the United States of the ongoing insurrection and rebellion in Michigan. I have included the information, nine pages sent today, to, uh, on May 8, 2020, to the Michigan Catholic Conference for your inspection as God's witness that the conference has been properly noticed of its call to duty to God and country and the counterfeit oath of Gretchen Esther Whitmer. Thank you for your service. Okay, so that's me. Right? That's how I handle my business. I'm not going to tell you how to, what you should do or whatever, but, you know, if you're not happy with the things, the way things are, where well, you could go to the, whatever organization in your church handles matters of public policy and show them the fact that, you know, they're not taking the proper oath to office. That'd be a really good place to start. The other thing that we could do, and, uh, I'm going to start doing it tomorrow, is, uh, you know, get some good oil. Virgin olive oil would be the best, but it doesn't have to be. Right? Get some oil. Bless it. And then go to every public building that you can find and put the sign of the cross on the door and uh, claim the property in the name of Jesus for the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Right? And the devil will flee. Now, I had just watched a video not too long ago about an exorcist talking about this very phenomenon where he was taking a psychiatrist for the first time, right, to go to see, for this psychiatrist's first time, to go watch and do an exorcism. And uh, one of the things he had told the gal was, you know, he wanted to put the sign of the cross on her hand. And he said, now, don't rub it off. And when we get to the, when we get to the door... The demon won't want to shake my hand, but he'll want to shake yours, so please shake his hand. And uh, as it turned out, it was a lady when they got to the door. It was a woman, not a, not a guy. So, you know, the, the, the woman didn't, hand, didn't extend her hand to the priest, but did to the psychiatrist. So she shook the woman's hand, her hand having oil up, holy oil on it. And uh, the demon repelled, went to the kitchen and tried to wash it off, and they, you know, the they could actually see the demon transforming within the body of this person, right? We're starting to show themselves to be what they were. And, uh, well, I was telling that story to a friend of mine, Dana Reed Smith, up in Cadillac. And he said, you know, he says, just funny how this stuff works, that there was a guy up in, you know, northern Michigan that at some time in the past had put holy oil on his hand in the sign of the cross. And he shook hands with a prosecutor, one of the local counties. And uh, the guy got so sick, in fact, he may have died of it, but he got so sick and whatever happened was so, you know, um, what would be the proper word, traumatic to the court, to the system, that they actually sent uh, the police out to his property to see if he had uh, chemical weapons. Because that's how badly it affected the man just having touched holy oil. And so I believe that we should take all of these people in public office and give them the holy oil, oil test, right? And if they can't handle the oil, then they can't be in the government because they're not of the same race as we are, right? They're of the race of the devil. So there's only, you know, truly there is only one race. It's the race of Adam. That's what it says in the Bible. But Cain wasn't from Adam. Cain was from the devil. So there's the race of the devil. That's the tares. And there's a race of Adam, we're the wheat. Well, people that aren't of our species can't be in our government. And they're not of our species. They may look like us, but they're of the devil. And the devil can't handle a holy oil. So it's a real simple test. You know, anoint them in holy oil and see if they freak. If they do, then kick them out. But until we can do that, we can still go claim all the public buildings. Right, go to the door, put a sign of the cross on a holy, holy oil, say a little prayer, go into courtroom, <laughs> put some on there, right, every place you can, court, city hall, county buildings, hospitals, 
I say that Walmart is a uh, is a public building, right? It's a it's a publicly traded building or a publicly traded entity. So somehow, some way, some somebody that you have some connection to has uh, you know stock in that company. So you know, yeah. Every place you can. You got people that go into you know the store and they lick ice cream. That kind of stuff, right? On all them doors, on all them refrigerator doors, put the sign of the cross. Da 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 da. I think we could, you know, start taking back the kingdom and put the fear of God in a bunch of people and uh, really scare the devil right to the edge of, you know, him wanting just to leave and go into the fiery pit all on his own. <laughs> but until we claim the kingdom back, that isn't going to happen. And uh, so one way is change a public policy, and the other way is go claim the property with the sign of the cross think about it and uh, I'm going to leave it there you'll have a great day and please do let somebody know that uh, whether it be your governor or your township supervisor or whomever that they didn't take this oath they don't have any authority in the United States and that's the oath found in 4 USC 101 you can Google it, and you can carry a copy in your wallet, and I would put it in your court case. I would give it to the tax man. I would do whatever you think you can, whoever you think you can give it to. Give them a copy and say, if you don't have one of these, you don't have any authority, you need to stop. Right? Until you can produce this oath, you ain't got one. Well, good deal. You all have a great day now. See you. Happy Mother's Day. Bye-bye.